We're going to get, uh, get started here. Thank you all for joining us. I am Mark Moyer, the director of the Project on Military and Diplomatic History here at uh, CSIS. Uh, we formed this center last year to help inform both the policy world and also the public on how history can help us understand current foreign policy issues. Uh, and we'd like to especially promote historians who also do work in the policy world, and that includes our speaker today. Uh, and we also like to promote interaction between historians and policy experts. And we have one of our own CSIS policy experts here today, Alice Friend, who I'll introduce uh, um, later in the event. I'll give you a couple other events coming up for those who may be interested. We have uh, October 10th, we're going to have Carter Malkasian talking about his book, Illusions of Victory, The Anbar Awakening and the Rise of the Islamic State. On October 18th, we'll have Lawrence Friedman on his book, The Future of War, A History. And October 24th, we have Calder Walton talking about the history of foreign interference in elections. And if you're not already on our mailing list, you can sign up for it on our website. Uh, one of the virtues of history is that it uh, provides us with rich, rich contextual understanding. I think if you study a country for years and years, as historians do, um, you learn how individuals and groups and institutions interact uh, and in a way that otherwise I don't think you would understand fully. You learn how also people's views of their own history shapes their worldview uh, and you find out more about how these countries are different from others. Uh, I think one of the leading problems with some of our recent interventions is that we did not pay enough attention to history before we went in. Uh, I remember with the Iraq war, people were talking about how we could democratize Iraq because we had democratized, say, Indonesia. Um, I think if you'd actually, people who had studied the history of Iraq and Indonesia extensively would probably know that, in fact, they are quite different, and so we need to be very careful. Uh, I think we uh, saw similar problems when we went into Libya in 2011. There wasn't a, a full recognition, uh, a really much of an understanding of Libyan history, and, and our speaker will tell us much more about that today. Um, I'll introduce uh, our speaker, Federica Fasanati, is a non-resident fellow in the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence of the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Uh, her field work and research have covered Afghanistan, Libya, Ethiopia, Somalia. Uh, her latest book is The Army in the Bush, Italian Counterinsurgency, 1860 to 1943. Uh, she has a doctorate from the University of Milan. And following her studies, she moved to Rome where she is active with the Central Historical Office of the Italian Army and the Historical Office of the Italian Ministry of Defense. So uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Fasanati to CSIS. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I see many friends, and so thank you. OK, uh, today we, I hope to be not too boring, but we are talking about history and how history has shaped uh, Libya in many, in many ways. So if we, anyway, if we look at Libya today, we have uh, three fundamental issues, in my opinion. One is local, uh, and uh, it is strictly connected with the history of the country. Uh, the other one is regional, and uh, it is given by the absence of a strong government, always connected uh, with the first problem, which is local. And uh, then a third one, which is strategic. Um, and uh, to the, the, the regional mess that we have, um, there are other strategic problems, uh, much bro broader, let's say, broader issues, uh, connected to the energy, to terrorism, uh, migrations, uh, for us, above all Italians, and uh, of course, a geostrategic competition. Uh, so if we go to the first problem, uh, the local one, uh, we see that it is formed by many little issues, little in, in the sense of, of course, uh, just to say, but they are in, we have internal divisions, we have uh, uh, no strong leadership, no public administration, 
no investments, uh, and these are, are the results uh, not only from 2011, but these are results uh, of uh, centuries uh, of the history of the country. So it's not a case that today we have all these kind of problems. Um, so if we start, I, I promise I will be very, very quick, but if, if we have to start, I think, from the beginning of the formation of uh, the Libyan state, so uh, during the Ottoman Empire. And uh, the Ottoman rule in Libya has been, uh, lasted a long centuries, and um, Libya was divided. Uh, the, the core of the Ottoman rule was Tripoli with the Pasha. Uh, but that, then we have a bay in Benghazi, a kind of agent of the Pasha, and uh, uh, all the, the, the leaders, uh, uh, of the tribal leaders in the Fetzan who gave allegiances to the Pasha. So Libya, as you can see, was divided anyway. Uh, when Italians uh, came uh, during, uh, at the beginning of the, the, the 20th century, in uh, between, uh, the, let's say, in uh, 19, uh, 1912, uh, they fought against the Ottomans. They won uh, the war. But in the end, uh, they, they found out uh, that there was another enemy, uh, Libyans. And they started a, a, a terrible counterinsurgency uh, in, in, uh, in the country uh, that lasted, lasted until, uh, let's say, 1931, when uh, the hero of the insurgents, Omar al Mukhtar, was caught and hanged in a concentration camp. In those period, in the period of the Italians, Libya was already uh, divided, this time in two parts. Uh, Tripolitania and the part of Fetzan, the desert, and Cyrenaica. This until 1928. Uh, then it was unified for military reasons, and if someone is interested, I can, I can talk about that after. Um, and in 1934, it became a real part uh, of Italy uh, under the leadership of Italo Balbo. But anyway, it was unified but divided to be better controlled in five provinces. Mm, Tripoli, Benghazi, uh, Derna, and so on. The southern uh, military territories, just to make you understand. So it was also and uh, always divided. Um, then during the uh, Allied occupation, uh, again, uh, last, mm, the, that kind of occupation that was more a kind of protectorate, of course, uh, lasted from, uh, let's say, 1943 during the Second World War when Italians lost the country um, until 1951 when the king, uh, Idris Asenusi, came and uh, took power. In, during the Allied uh, protectorate, let's call it like this, uh, also, uh, Great Britain took uh, Cyrenaica and uh, Tripolitania, and of course France uh, or the Fets, and for obvious uh, reasons. Mm, the king came after his exile uh, caused by Italians, uh, he went to Egypt, he came back uh, in 1944, he became king uh, afterwards, and he decided and it's not a case again, to give uh, to Libya a um, federal constitution uh, immediately at the beginning. And uh, this federal constitution uh, created the federal state, also this time divided in three big regions, Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, Cyrenaica, and uh, uh, sometimes I use, uh, I use the Italian words, sorry, <laughs> and Fetzan. And uh, of course, uh, the, federal, the, the federal state uh, during the, the time of Idri, Idris al-Senussi was not perfect at all. And uh, Idris had to manage enormous and huge and rooted uh, conflicts inside, uh, inside the country. Um, a part of the country wanted 
the federal state, uh, but another part of the country was absolutely against it. And so all these frictions, of course, uh, did not help uh, uh, the king, who in the end, uh, in um, 1963, decided to, for the abolition of the federal state, and to, decided to unify the country under, under his hands. Uh, without uh, the, the regions, without the vilaya, without anything, just all the power in his hands. But also, the power in his hands did not work. And in fact, a few years uh, after, uh, Gaddafi, a young colonel, came out and, and, and made uh, what, what, what was, let's say, what they called the revolution. But Libya n was not in a good shape anyway, because also the Gaddafi period, uh, many problems came out, uh, and the country was incredibly divided. Also in, 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 in those decades, because we are talking about almost 40 years. Um, but what did Gaddafi to get the country united? He, he, he did not very differently uh, by the Italians, frankly. And uh, using what the Latins, uh, the ancient Roman, always uh, used in, in, in the empire, divide et impera, uh, divide et rule. And he did exactly the same with uh, uh, the little, little ethnic uh, diversities, uh, with uh, the tribes, uh, putting one against the other. And uh, when he, that was not eno enough, he used uh, um, the Italians. So the hate against the colonialist. And uh, so in the end, the country was incredibly divided, and Gaddafi took these divisions, these diversities, uh, as a tool to, to better uh, manage the country. Um, so when the revolution, uh, the Arab Spring, came, uh, in reality, the country was profoundly divided already. And, um, and, uh, and the point is that when the international community helped uh, one part of the country, the rebels, to fight Gaddafi. The point is that <coughs> behind Gaddafi, there was another part of the country. And so it became immediately a civil war. And um, so today, what can, talking about always the first point, the first issue, the local issue, I just talk about history just to make you understand that Libya has never been united. Libya has never been really has never known democracy, because Ottomans, uh, Italians, uh, and then the king, it was not a democracy because Idris in certain times has been really uh, ruthless and cruel. And, uh, and then, of course, Gaddafi, that was not a democracy. So we, we, when everything started in 2011, we had in front of us a country incredibly weak, um, difficult to define today as a state, in my opinion, but we can discuss about, it, about that after. So today we have many problems given to, to that background, and uh, we can see the divisions in every possible way. We have political divisions, GNA polarization, so GNA against the HOR, and internal in Tripolitania and Tripoli we have uh, the followers of what was the GNC and uh, Khalifa Gued. So, political divisions. Um, then we have ethnic divisions. So again, uh, ethnicity uh, is not so strong as in other countries in Libya, but we have uh, problems, uh, for example, atavistic problems, again, uh, with uh, Tebu against uh, Tuareg and so on. Uh, then we have tribal divisions. Uh, just a uh, few days ago, uh, there were, we had, um, in Libya had uh, clashes uh, between two tribes, men of two tribes, uh, Warfalla, what we called in Italy Orfella, and Gaddafi, uh, the tribe of Gaddafi. Uh, Mishasha against Zintan, Zintan against Misrata. So it's it's continuously a mess, uh, a, 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 you know, a clash against different divisions. 
Uh, on top of these divisions, we have external actors, and they are doing uh, their business. So on one side, we have, I, I cannot say Europe, because it's a mess, let's say maybe Italy, and uh, United States, and Unsmil, apparently the international community uh, that supports uh, the GNA. But on the other side of the plate, we have, of the table, we have uh, uh, other external actors like uh, Russia, like Emirates, like first of all Egypt, who are interested in doing other business. And so this uh, presence of external actors taking part for one part or the other disrupts, uh, has disrupted completely the normal process of, let's say, democratization of the country, uh, spoiling everything. And um, so, and here we come to the second problem, the regional problem, uh, which is played by, of, of course, external actor and um, also in the Maghreb, Tunisia on one side, Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, and on the other side, Egypt. Um, and inside the country, in the region, uh, there is lack of everything. So uh, the fact that we don't have a strong government, because GNA is not a strong government, and a part of the country does not recognize it, um, the, it's been a problem for the economy because no investments at all in the country in every possible way. Uh, for the social fabric uh, because people in Libya do not feel to be supported by the government and they feel to be absolutely alone. And you can see this above all in the FETSAN. And then, um, of course, uh, a complete absence of a leadership, uh, a political class that can take uh, and can uh, lead the country. Um, so we don't have uh, a good, let's say, a class of politicians. We don't have a good economy. And on top of that, we don't have uh, security at all. And this, this problem, this issue of security takes us takes us to the third uh, issue, big issue, which is the strategic one. So we have uh, the problem uh, for, let's say, uh, issues, internal issues. Terrorism, migrations, um, of course, uh, let's say, the problem of energy, which is strictly connected with the problem, uh, let's say, geopolitical uh, competition inside the chessboard, the African, uh, the Northern African chessboard. So terrorism, uh, after all the division we've seen uh, after the top, uh, where there are the external uh, actors, we have underground uh, as a spring uh, the problem of the Salafi Jihadi groups. Uh, usually when we talk uh, about the Salafi problem in Libya, we, we talk about ISIS, uh, not so much, I have to say, even though the last uh, strong, uh, uh, terrible clash in Misrata was about ISIS. Uh, then uh, we have Al-Qaeda, Ansar al-Sharia, Murabitun, whatever. But they are the, the name, the superstar. Then there is a, a constellation of other actors, uh, criminal actors, and that, that is another problem in Libya. The um, conjunction between terrorism and criminal groups, normal criminal groups. Um, sometimes they act together, sometimes uh, the lines are different, but uh, the problem is incredible because criminality is, is, is growing in the country. Because of course there is, there is no security, there is no a strong government that can take uh, a big part in this, in this problem. Um, of course, uh, given the fact uh, that, given all the things that we've seen until now, 
Libya has become not only a super safe haven for terrorism and so on, but also the door for Europe, for n a new kind of migra migration. Uh, in the past, uh, there was uh, another uh, route, uh, the Atlantic one, uh, starting from Senegal, going to Spain, through Morocco, and the Canaries. And, uh, but now we have three big routes, and all these routes from the Sahel, they all go through Libya. Uh, different parts, different cities of Libya, but the point is that they the, the final target is Europe. And just the last year, we, we've had um, something like uh, almost 200,000 migrants in the, in the country, just uh, in Italy, coming from just this number coming from Libya. Um, so this is another important strategic uh, problem. Uh, and, uh, and then there is the problem of energy. Italy is not a producer of energy and uh, so uh, needs to have uh, to, exp to import energy from the east of Europe of course but historically from the south and so gas oil whatever they come from Libya for us the majority um, and of course given the fact that Libya uh, from 1959 uh, has been a producer of, lo of oil, one of the best in the world, this opens another ge ge let's say strategic problem, which is absolutely geopolitical, a kind of geopolitical competition. So Libya has become uh, the theater for uh, a proxy war uh, fought by Qatar on one side and Emirates on the other. Um, um, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria on one side and Egypt on the other and above all the West and Russia, of course, because the history uh, of Russia in Libya is old, it's not new. So um, that's another big problem because uh, Russia is not only interested in oil when we talk about Libya, but is interested in ports, for example. Um, Tobruk or uh, you know, Benghazi, they could be perfect points in the Mediterranean. Uh, the Syrian part is not enough, and uh, Russian did not, d do not have a strong fleet in the Mediterranean. So this is another uh, point on the table. Um, I think I, 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 made a, I gave you just an idea, and now I'm ready to questions. Well, we'll uh, and yeah, thanks for those great comments. And uh, I should mention, too, that we, uh, a lot of what we do, as you notice, are, are books, but we also focus on timely issues. And I went, I uh, knew Libya was a hot one, and so looked all over the place to find a person who was best suited to do this, and uh, found Dr. Fazanati, um, and uh, delighted you to find you. As you, as you heard, she's uh, ex extraordinarily knowledgeable on the subject. Um, before we get to the questions, I'm going to uh, let our discussants say a few words, um, and I'll introduce her first to Alice uh, Hunt Friend, is a senior fellow here in the International Security Program at, at uh, CSIS, uh, and she focuses on African security issues and also civil military relations, and she's currently a doctoral student at American University's School of International Service. Uh, from 2012 to 2014, she was the Principal Director for African Affairs in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, uh, focusing on North and West African counterterrorism. Uh, she joined DOD in 2009 as Special Assistant to the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy uh, and also served as a Senior Advisor to the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans and Forces and as Country Director for Pakistan. So, Alice. Thanks, Mark, um, and thank you, Dr. Fazanotti, for thank you. those remarks. And also, we had the opportunity to have lunch with her earlier, and it was very interesting, and I learned a lot. Um, I'm just going to give very brief remarks because I'm sure the audience is very eager to, to ask our guest questions. Um, but in, in reviewing the history of Libya over the past few days and over the past few hours, um, it made me reflect on how, how policymakers use history. 
um, and is in fact what Mark asked me to talk about. And I think it's safe to say that in the American context, which is the only policy-making context I have expertise in, um, history gets pretty short shrift. Um, but uh, what treatment history does get is very um, uneven between agencies and between layers of the bureaucracy. So I worked at the Department of Defense, um, which meant that I worked very closely with counterparts at the State Department, especially those who worked in posts. And I found that, that people who worked uh, in embassies, but also people who were on the desk at the State Department, very frequently had uh, an impressive depth of knowledge of the history of their, of their country and their region that they were in um, that wasn't uh, reflected in my agency. In my agency, um, the, the emphasis was much less on history and much more on contemporary operations for obvious reasons. Um, we had a, a different set of incentives. Um, but I was always struck at um, the, the unevenness between agencies when we got together uh, at the, the NSC in particular, um, but also between the layers of bureaucracy. Uh, so in, in the US government, you have sort of the first line of defense for any particular country or region is the action officer. And the action officer is supposed to be the subject matter expert. So the action officer for Libya is supposed to know Libya, is supposed to know Libya's history very, very well. Um, not as well as Dr. Fezzanotti, but well. Uh, as you grow up the chain of command, you don't have subject matter experts anymore. You have uh, broad expertise in how to make policy. And you have people at higher and higher levels of responsibility so that instead of just spanning Libya, they span all of Africa. Then they span, uh, in at DOD where I worked, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and Europe, and Russia. Uh, and then there's the undersecretary who has the globe and every functional issue that the department does as well. And so the uh, you know, brain capacity that is left over for the history of one particular country in one particular office uh, diminishes quite dramatically as you go up the chain of command. Um, and these are the people, by the way, that are making the policy. Mm -hmm. So when you're sitting around at high levels of the National Security Council, they may have all the briefing books in the world written by very knowledgeable subject matter experts, but they only have so much time and capacity to absorb what's in there. Um, and so they do one of the things that I want to point out um, to use history, which is they use it heuristically. They use it as a shortcut. Um, policymakers are, uh, if not by training, are generally by um, orientation political scientists and not historians, and as somebody trained in political science myself, I will say that um, we and the historians often are suspicious of each other because we have a fundamentally different understanding of the way the world works. Political scientists think that social and political life has patterns and is repetitious, and you will say, see the same thing over and over again. Historians think everything is complex and contingent, because it is. Um, yeah. But political scientists are trying to see the similarities across human experience, because they, those are there too. And so they tend to use heuristics. They tend to say, um, well, I've seen this before in Somalia, so it must be the same in Libya. I made the same uh, error today. I said, well, isn't that a little bit like Switzerland? And everyone <laughs> at the table went, no. Um, we love analogy. Analogy uh, is a heuristic. It's a shortcut. Uh, and we love to do it as well. I've noticed at the senior most levels, uh, which I did not achieve, but they also love analogy from their own experience. So somebody who went through Mogadishu is going to see Mogadishu from 1993, I mean, again. Um, somebody who's been an ambassador in one country, naturally as a human being, is going to want to apply that, that expertise elsewhere. Um, and so that is one of the ways we use history. Um, the other way we use it, at the junior levels is the opposite problem. It's too much expertise, too much depth, too much detail. Uh, and uh, generally, action officers are very poor at translating that up, in part because they're talking to an audience that wants a heuristic, that wants a really simple causal relationship. So if I push this button, if I give arms to this particular militia in Libya, that will solve the problem, right? Maybe if we back Haftar, that will cause unification amongst the people of Libya. They're always searching for that answer um, for a whole host of reasons, but in part because they use these heuristics. Um, and it is very, very hard to take these complex, contingent situations 
uh, and hundreds of years of history and translate it into prescriptive policies to say, well, then this is what the United States should do in this context today. Um, and so instead, those people tend to be naysayers. They tend to be the ones that are saying, don't do that. Take no action. That's a stupid idea. Um, and so they're not very popular because um, the United States is an optimistic country and we tend to have a bias for action, for decisive action. Um, we want to do something. And so for the experts in the room uh, on history, who are usually, first of all, very junior, so they're already having, they already have challenges in being heard, um, but are also saying, well, you know, think back to the Ottoman Empire, many eyes around the room start to glaze over. Uh, and so there's a real challenge. Um, I ask you, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, and I will confess, I, I worked the Africa account and I, I did a lot of work on Libya and I didn't really learn about Libya's history until I left because I did not have the time. I was one of yeah. the people that had to know what was happening in all 53 countries in our area of operations. Um, and now that I've read the history of Libya in much more depth, uh, I can see places where, of course, this is what would happen if we took that action. But I didn't know how to tell my action officers how to translate that for me, and how to tell me, the, so what should be my talking point when I'm at the NSC next week? And what is my talking point that isn't just, that's a bad idea, that's not gonna go well. It has to be, here's what we should do, here's what money we should put where, Here's what authority we should use. Um, if we're going to train the Libyans to have a general purpose force, this is how we're going to get it done. Um, that's very, very hard for an action officer to translate. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing I'll say is I think that the third way that policymakers treat history is as something in the past, which is to say that it exercises no force on events today, which is, of course, not true. Um, but I think especially in the American context, we feel um, sort of not as burdened, even though we are. We are as burdened by our past as any other country in the world, but we don't seem to feel it culturally. Um, and other places where we, and DOD would say where we operate, um, but where we are, where we engage, uh, it is felt uh, more keenly, and even if it isn't, of course it's still operating on the present. Um, it's had incredible political, cultural, economic impacts on where we are today. Um, and so to operate without understanding it is uh, generally folly, as Barbara Tuckman would have said, um, but is also, again, very, very hard for policymakers to do in a parsimonious, in a simple way. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that and let the audience uh, have their opportunity to okay. talk to you. Great. Well, we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, you'll state your name and affiliation. In the back, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marwan. I work with the National Democratic Institute here in Washington, D.C. Um, and so my question is, um, as Dr. Fasanotti said, uh, the, the case in Libya is uh, it's, a, it's essentially a proxy war with Qatar versus uh, the UAE, with the, with the West versus Russia. And so uh, you then moved on to say that uh, you know, the United States tries to have uh, a decisive action. So my question is, how are you able to uh, create this decisive action that is beneficial to the Libyans, but at the same time countering uh, Russian influence in the region. And so there's always this question of, uh, you know, is the policy pro-American or is it anti-Russian or is it pro-Libyan? And so, you know, within all of this times, all the actors that are involved, uh, how are you ever able to come up with uh, anything sustainable, I guess? Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a very good question, but very difficult. <laughs> To, you know, to, to give you an answer for sure, in the sense that uh, the situation right now is incredibly complex. Something has changed in the very few, last few weeks. Uh, a new actor has come out, uh, and uh, is Gassam Salame. So um, he, he gave a plan, um, very, understandable and very logic. Um, but the point is that uh, my fear, as I was telling before, is that uh, are the international community, is the international community really um, focused on solving the problem in Libya? 
So uh, you are asking me what the United States can do uh, about Russia and the proxy war of Qatar and the Emirates and so on. Well, I think that the United States in this case has uh, a big, uh, can, can have a big impact in terms of diplomacy. So I don't think that uh, the solution for the United States, that's what I think, uh, we can discuss on this, but uh, it's the boots on the ground and the military solution to keep every, everybody you know, calm. Um, I think that uh, here is the moment that the real uh, protagonists uh, are Libyans, not uh, Russia. That was, you cannot imagine, uh, looking at the situation, the, 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 evol the situation that is evolving from 2011, uh, how uh, disruptive has been the presence of the external actors. And uh, in a country that is historically weak as Libya, because Libya, as I, I was telling, has no history of democracy, of auto-governing. It has always been like, you know, a, 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 an hybrid in many respects, political hybrid. And uh, so even though we have five million inhabitants in the country, a country as large as Alaska, which is incredible, um, still we don't have a solution. And we don't have a solution be because I think uh, Libyans have been too much pushed by one side uh, towards one side or the other. So the responsibility of the external actors here is huge, immense. And uh, I think that the solution for the United States in this very moment with Ghassam Salame, with the new plan, uh, with uh, some points uh, coming in the future, uh, it is a, a diplomatic solution. So trying to help in this way. But help, first of all, uh, Libyans. Amen. Pardon me, sorry, Deborah Jones, a former U.S. ambassador to Libya. Um, when we look at models of governance in Libya, and let, let's just talk about Libya within, with all of the kind of the political, I don't want to call it the illiteracy, but the lack of experience politically that it's had. And yeah. you've now looked at it over a series, you know, historically over a series of different influences and, and um, invaders, governors, whatever, people who've been in charge. So what from a historian's perspective, has been the period of, of most efficiency, most efficient governance, and what is the model that came out of that? Because right now, obviously there's a competition between what we tried to do as an international community was to, which was to build consensus, you know, in a consensus society, um, or now people who are looking at a more authoritarian, a replacement that they hope will be more directive is it a combination? Was it distribution of wealth? What, what did you see historically? I'm just asking historically what has worked best for Libya from a historian's perspective? Well, uh, I'd say uh, probably the best one, probably, but I have to discuss with my friend Karim Mezran. <laughs> <laughs> probably uh, the kingdom of Idris uh, because uh, it was uh, a man from uh, a, an incredibly important family from Cyrenaica. Uh, he represented uh, uh, hope, and uh, in the end, uh, um, he followed his people in many respects, and he did many things. Um, but another, another period of, uh, and uh, this is really, I'm, I'm telling you something many people will, uh, will not agree with me, but the period after the reconquest of Libya made by Italians, the period, let's say, from 1934 to uh, the moment in which, uh, let's say, the, the Italian government handed 1944, and another period after, when Italians were in Libya, I think that they did a lot for the country. But 
I'm not talking about the uh, counterinsurgency operations, the war, uh, the bloodshed, and whatever, after, in let's say a, a, a peaceful Libya. So, but if I, if, I, if I have to choose, probably I'd say the kingdom of uh, Idris, probably. Because all the rest, uh, I mean, I don't want to talk here about the Ottoman rule. It is too, <laughs> with a Pasha, it, it's too, you know, 16th century, it's a little bit too much. But uh, looking at the contem con contemporary modern Libya, I'd say probably that period after, the Allied occupation protectorate, it was nothing. It was just a period of transition. And the Gaddafi period, well, I, I've been very ruthless against uh, that period because uh, he was a Libyan and he did not invest in anything. And above all, he did not invest in childhood education, uh, which uh, would have changed the face of Libya nowadays. So um, and you are a Libyan, how can you do this? In, the, in, the, in modern times. So we, we don't have so many choice, yeah. Ambassador. Just, uh, you know, uh, I can, uh, the king, and telling you that the kingdom of Idris was not perfect at all, uh, full of frictions, as I said, and uh, clashes and uh, political problems. Uh, but in the end, it was a period of light. Um, Libya was one of the five probably poorest country in the world. And in 1959, it became a rich country because of the oil. So it was a period of, uh, you know, positive period in, in for some aspects. And uh, given the history of Libya in general, I'd say that decade. Thanks. And by the way, for those who are watching us on the uh, webcast, we are taking questions on our Twitter account if you'd like to uh, question remotely, it's at C-S-I-S-P-M-D-H. So again, at C-S-I-S-P-M-D-H. Uh, sir, in the front row. Uh, Bill Lawrence, George Washington University. I um, wanted to ask about Libyan tribes. Um, those of the political science persuasion and some of those of the history persuasion and sociological persuasions and anthropological um, and others often imagine that tribes are a big part of the solution um, in Libya. And I would posit that, first of all, they're not always atavistic. The Meshashia tribe you mentioned is invented. In the last couple of decades, it was a group of African migrants from different areas that Gaddafi Push, kicked people out of their homes and stuck them there, and next thing you know, we have a ch tribal chief of a tribe that never existed. Um, uh, the second uh, point is the failure of various tribal strategies, like Gaddafi in 2011 tried to use a tribal strategy that completely failed, and one of the slogans of the revolution was la la kabbalia, you know, no to tribalism. Mm -hmm. None of the militias are named after tribes. Um, and yet we hear so much about how tribes are a big part of the solution, so my question for you, given our topic today, right, is, um, oh, one last point. When Libyans negotiate, they often make references to tribal pacts, mm -hmm. right, and tribal history, and yet it's often imagined history, mm -hmm. right? So, so given all these tribal framings and imaginations and imagined history, you know, what are the lessons of Libyan tribal history for contemporary politics? <laughs> well, it's a very difficult question. Um, I think that uh, you can read everything uh, on tribes in Libya, as you said. So uh, there is a part uh, of scholars uh, who um, I've read uh, many reports and books uh, and things uh, in, in the last few couple of years yeah. telling that tribes are really uh, fundamental. Uh, I think that uh, on the other side, no, tribes are nothing. Tribes uh, do not exist anymore. Uh, I can tell you historically that they, they existed and absolutely. Uh, they were really the structure of the country. For example, when Italian, uh, Italians came uh, in 1912, they had to relate themselves only 
with elders and notables uh, and leaders of the tribes, only with them. They were the, uh, the point of, uh, you know, the, the core of every pro problem for the Italians. And this until uh, uh, the end of their occupation in 1943. So, mm, decades. Yeah, decades. Uh, now tribes, uh, uh, do, do the tribes uh, uh, exist? Um, I think that we, we should think like, um, I'm Italian. I should think like uh, for a mafia problem. Because mafia is uh, uh, the, 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 the social fabric. Uh, tribes are, have nothing to see with mafia. So I'm jumping to Italy. But uh, when, I, when I listen to uh, people telling, you know, but mafia does not exist anymore, uh, you know, the, the, the associations uh, connected to mafia, mafia, Sacra Corona Unita, Camorra, whatever, Andrangheta, I'm telling you all the names of the different mafias in Italy, uh, that made, by the way, part of the history of Italy, um, when they say they do not exist anymore, it, no, it is not true, because they've changed their face. And uh, in many respects, now we, have, we, we are changed. We, have, we are different from one century ago. We live with the uh, cell, uh, the mobiles, we live with technology, so everything is different. Also in Italy, mafia, but mafia still is there. And the concept of family, uh, uh, profound and rooted in the Italian society, it has changed, yes, but it's always there. And so I, I see this, uh, um, this the, the idea of the tribe in, in a very similar way. So tribes have changed their face. Uh, they are not always, uh, not anymore the same of one century ago. But still uh, the connection for Libyans, I think, I guess, uh, you can correct me, but uh, the meaning of the tribe, the, 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 um, the consistent of that social um, uh, body is still important, is still important. So um, I think that, yes, we, we cannot do, uh, we cannot build a new state uh, just only thinking at the tribes because the ancient tribe does not ex exist anymore. But we can, uh, that can help in some way, creating the connection, and yes, I think uh, that we can use it. In the back. Hello, thanks uh, for your time. Uh, my name is David Balif. I'm with the Ministry of Defense Advisors Program with the U.S. Department of Defense. And with all the security difficulties in Libya right now and the instability, um, those who are you know, high-level bureaucrats or consultants, advisors, um, many people can't even go into the country now. So what would your advice be to those, particularly with NATO and other multilateral institutions who um, are seeking to help stabilize the country to make a difference, um, who aren't physically able to go to the country? If you were to advise somebody in that position, um, what would you say to them? What are some of the steps they could take? Thank you. Uh, well. I should have the crystal ball, frankly, to, to answer you in the right way. Uh, but because I'm just an historian, of course, and uh, it, it is very difficult to give you a right answer. Um, what I think is that, first of all, the core of the problem is in trying to convince Libyans that it's time for them to become a country, a nation finally by themselves and um, but giving them space because in 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 the last six years i, I haven't seen this and i've seen all uh, the nato uh, um, and uh, you know nato whatever yun's uh, acting from the top and, and never from the bottom so libya what does libya uh, need right now uh, economy, um, a, a, a strong social fabric, uh, security. So I think that, uh, um, yes, NATO and uh, all these organisms have to act uh, 
uh, in trying to uh, form in, in a new possibility of government. But in the end, what, what is really important is what Libyans need. And so I'd start also from the bottom, in, in a double way, you know, trying to organize a new form of government, what is doing Salame in this moment. Uh, referendum, elections, uh, new constitution, and, and so on. But on the other side, looking at the needs of the country, because the country, the country is on uh, its food. And um, so, um, and above all, I, I, I will advise uh, uh, all the actors here playing uh, not to put any boots on the ground but to stay uh, behind and to help Libyans in doing something good for themselves, not for the other. So what I would say is, okay, maybe the United States, and I've said this, should help uh, Europe, because the United States is far away, should help Europe in helping Libyans, but just supporting them from behind, not we are not the actors in this uh, game, but Libyans, I, I guess. Can I add a thought to that? Which It's not as mature as I would like it to be, but um, if we can't get into the country, then I think coming up with some sort of comprehensive strategy for minimizing the proxy warfare mm -hmm. dynamic that's going on, I think would be the most helpful thing the United States could do. I don't know what the prospect for us taking leadership in that area Real, you know, realistically is, um, but if, you know, in, in the blue sky scenario, I think that would be the most helpful thing we could do to give the Libyans this space they need, because right now, again, per their history, they're not really uh, organically determining what sort of modes of governance they want. They're getting all kinds of different solutions imposed on them, and the only actor on the ground that's doing any sort of organic imposition is militias. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, if we can't, can't or won't, you know, have a presence on the ground that is um, meaningful enough uh, to have a decisive effect, then I think what we can do is engage all of the various outside actors to try and sort of minimize what what effects they're having that yeah. aren't that Absolutely. aren't constructive. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And Federica, I wanted to ask you something that came up earlier when we were talking with some government officials, because this is, I think, particularly. Uh, useful to what we're doing. Um, going back to 2011, had uh, policymakers been well versed in Libyan history, how might things have been different? Could it have actually made a difference in what's happened since? Uh, well, yes. Uh, I think that uh, if uh, history, and uh, I think that really there was in, in those months uh, a, a lack of uh, knowledge of the country. Uh, when I saw uh, certain actions uh, in, in before October 2011, I said, oh my God, oh my God. Uh, for example, arming, arming the rebels. One of the uh, most important uh, things to do in counterinsurgency operations is disarming the populace. So how can you think you are helping rebels um, and the, the population of Libya, do, um, giving them weapons? Now in Libya, I don't know the numbers, but I, 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 I told um, one hour ago something like 20 million weapon for, weapons for six five million, five or six million see, people. Yeah. Yes, yeah, six millions, but I always say five millions because I think that the, many of them mm -hmm. are you know, mm -hmm. spread in Tunisia, mm -hmm. Egypt, whatever. Italy as well at this point. So, um, and many, I think many mistakes could have been avoided. Uh, uh, just, just knowing the internal dynamics of the country, the historical internal dynamics. And uh, so, in my opinion, the Western intervention, which is not only a Western intervention, let's say the international intervention in Libya in 2011 has been wrong just because of this. Uh, sir, in the front. So 
Thank you. Uh, this is Ahmed Nabil from Embassy of Egypt. And actually, I wanna I have a question mainly uh, about the internal identities in Libya. I was working at the Embassy of Egypt in Tripoli since 2009 till 2012. I have attended the time of revolution and one year after this. Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, I have seen something is new is created internally, it's being created internally in Libya about the identity and the importance of tribes. I think there's new identity in Libya was formed during the 2011 revolution. It's the identity of the city itself. When every city has faced the forces of Gaddafi alone, like Misrata, like Zawiya, like Zwara, this created very important new identity internally in Libya. The, the identity, where do you come from in Libya? Tribes are still existed, but for example, Warfala. Warfala is headquarters in Bani Walid, but mm -hmm. at the same time, the people of Warfala, they yes, are sure. over one million yes. Warfalians. They are living from Bani Ghazi to Trevoli. Uh, in Bani Ghazi, they are at like internal uh, Libyan cosmopolitan, is have from many tribes, so that the structure of tribes are important, but at the same time, they didn't have the ability to control everything like now in Libya until before the revolution. I still remember February 11th, it was Friday, 2011, Gaddafi had a very big meeting for tribes in Tripoli. He invited the head of tribes from the eastern part, asked them, please don't let the US to go out in demonstrations against the regime. We're going to pay them, we're going mm -hmm. to give them cars, Many things is we're going to solve many internal problems in Libya, but and they promised him actually <laughs> to do this. But what happened after the six days? They didn't have the ability to control the situation in the eastern part of Libya. But not only this, when the uh, demonstrations out in Tripoli and in Zintan in September 20th and September 21st, uh, all of them they asking for the revenge of the blood. Of, their, of the people who were killed in Bani Ghazi in February 17th. And it was very clear. I heard many stories from young men. They didn't listen to any advice from the head of the tribes in 2011. And they, not only this, some of them were asking sheikhs of the uh, tribe to leave the tribe. You are betraying the blood of the, our uh, brothers in the eastern uh, part. After revolution, completely different identity. When you talk to any Libyans, they say he's going to mention where they come from in the definition of the city. I'm from Bani Walid, I'm from, because that had meaning. If you are from Misrata, that means it means a lot. You are armed, powerful, yeah. you are a symbol of revolution, of resistance against Gaddafi. If you are from Bani Walid, that means you are still supporting the old regime. Uh, this is very important thing uh, about uh, the end. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You are right. You are, you are right. And still, the problems between Misrata and Tawarga and Zawiya, Zwara, Bani Ghazi, this is new identity created during sure. the revolution. And this actually, I think, is the most powerful, like now, still Egypt will uh, invite people from Misrata and the delegation has the identity of Misratians, people who are Misratians. Another thing is the clarification a little bit about the position of the direct neighborhood countries to Libya, like Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Italy. When we are actually dealing directly with uh, one side of the conflict in primary in Libya, we have a necessity for the security necessity. So That's it. We need to, we have, more than 1,200 kilometers our borders with Libya. We need to secure them. We have to talk first to the people of the East and after this, handling the politics uh, with the people of the West. The people in Italy, they are doing this. Government of Italy, government of Tunisia, the government of Algeria. So it is no sort of uh, to be pious to one side against another side, but we, we had a uh, security necessity in the beginning. And, but after this, we started to talk with all sides. Maybe we understand point of view of one side more than the others. We have reservations, but we have channels with all of them. But at the same time, I don't understand very far countries from Libya. They don't have 
share, they don't share any borders with them to intervene. And this actually what you called spoiling. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think it has been, uh, uh, I think it has been the real problem uh, of, uh, of Libya. Uh, on top, of course, of the problem uh, of the lack of identity. Because uh, uh, Libya was weak at the beginning of the revolution. So, uh, yes, I think that you are right. I, I agree with you. I cannot say anything against uh, your thought. Uh, tribes, as I was telling, they exist, the idea exists, and I think that they can be used uh, as an important tool of um, pacification of, even though we cannot, as I said, uh, do a peace uh, on tribes today. On the other side, uh, um, the problem is that uh, exactly what Alice was telling, uh, that the external actors uh, have to be motivated in some way to stop, to stop, because uh, they, they've really spoiled uh, the entire process of pacification giving strength to an actor or to others, for example. Well, we've uh, hit our time limit, but I want to thank uh, all of you for coming today and uh, thank Dr. Fasanati and uh, Alice Friend for joining us. If we could give uh, her a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>